So welcome to the lecture on the digestive system. Anatomy of the digestive system can be a bit long. And so I've chosen to divide this into some five parts. We'll do the lecture in five series. In the first series, which you're going to do today, we'll talk about some general concepts about anatomy of the digestive system. Then we look at the anatomy of the upper GIT. Then in our next session, we look at the anatomy of the intestines, basically. So we'll focus on both the small intestine as well as the large intestine. Thereafter, we will look at anatomy of the extrinsic organs of the digestive system. That should be organs, extrinsic organs of the digestive system. This is where we look at the anatomy of the liver, the pancreas, the biliary system, and uh, the extrinsic salivary glands. After that, we look at development and congenital malformations of the digestive system, but again, that is long. So I also prefer divided into two parts. The first one, we just look at the development and malformations of the whole GIT. And then the second part, we look at development and congenital malformations of the hepatobiliary system. That one is not that um, long, but if we combine it with the first one, it becomes really long. And that's why I prefer splitting it. So having said so, those are the five topics that you expect in the anatomy of the digestive system. Today, in this particular class, we are going to look at the first one, focusing on the general concepts, as well as anatomy of the upper GIT. So this is what we expect to learn from this particular session. We are going to classify the components of the digestive system, and we'll also explain the key roles of the digestive system. After that, we are going to name the components of the whole GIT in order, proximal distally. So basically, that's the path followed by food. After that, we'll be naming various sphincters which are along this particular HOLO-GIT. The sphincters which are along the alimentary canal, we'll be naming them and we'll be stating what they do. After that, we'll look deeply into the structural organization of the GIT wall, basically focusing on the histological structure of the wall of the digestive system. Now, those four are basically general concepts that will be applying to a number of things. And then now we'll focus on the anatomy of the various components of the upper GIT. We'll focus on the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and the stomach. When you talk of upper GIT, it may include plus the duodenum as part of the upper GIT. But in this session, we are not going to look at the duodenum. I'll prefer talking about duodenum together with the intestines. And so we'll just end it at the level of the stomach. Having said so, let's now look at the first agenda, which is to classify the components of the digestive system and also to explain the key role of the digestive system. We can classify the anatomical components of the digestive system this way, that we have two major components. This is what we call the hollow GIT. The hollow GIT refers to that part that is followed by food. So remember when you swallow, food goes through the mouth and just follow all that channel until one day, one time, it comes out through the anal canal, of course, what remains. So the part that is followed by food is what we call the hollow GIT. You can call it the alimentary canal or the gut. 
And then we have those organs or glands, which are not within the wall of the digestive system. So they are extrinsic. However, these organs produce their secretions into the lumen of the digestive system. So we call them extrinsic glands or extrinsic organs of the digestive system. They include the major salivary glands, the pancreas, the liver, and the gallbladder. If you heard me well, you had I said major salivary glands because they are major and minor salivary glands. The minor salivary glands are located within the wall of the digestive system. The glands which are located within the wall of the digestive system, or rather within the walls of the alimentary canal, are not extrinsic, they are intrinsic glands. And there are many intrinsic glands, not just limited to the salivary glands. There are many glands, as you're going to see when you look at the histologic organization of the GIT wall. So when you use the term extrinsic here, we're referring to the organs which are not incorporated in the wall of the hollow GIT, but provide their secretions into the lumen of the hollow GIT. And so they include those organs. So that is how we classify the components of the digestive system. In terms of function, we know that the digestive system is helpful in delivering both water as well as nutrients to the body. It is the one that supply the body with water and nutrients. That's a very key role, but there are other key functions of the digestive system as well. For example, we know that there's some hormones which are produced by the organs of the digestive system. Think about insulin from the pancreas, glucagon from the pancreas. But even if you don't limit yourself to the hormones of the pancreatic islets of lung hands, think about the other hormonal factors which are produced along the wall of the digestive system. You know, the cells along the wall of the digestive system consist of some cells which can produce hormones. They are scattered. They belong to what we call the diffuse endocrine system. But if you are to bring all those cells together, they might perhaps make one of the largest endocrine organs in the body. So there are many hormones which are produced by the cells along the wall of the intestines, for example, cholecystokinin, gastrin. There are many hormones and there are many functions. Well, their key functions are largely to the digestive system itself fine, but they can also have functions elsewhere. So digestive system has endocrine functions. Digestive system also help to excrete waste products and especially through the biliary system. Think about the, the, the products of uh, broken down red blood cells, you know, bilirubin. It's largely excreted through the biliary system. Lastly, there are immunological functions of the digestive system. And we can highlight a number. For example, the acidity within the stomach help to kill germs. But other than the acidity, along the wall of the digestive system, we also have several lymphoid aggregations. We call them mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue. Several within the wall of the GIT and those ones also help in fighting infections. So these are the key functions of the digestive system. Now, let's see how food moves. Or rather, before we see how food moves, let's revisit the key processes that food undergoes. When you take food into your body, what are the processes that food undergo? The first process that food undergoes is the ingestion process. And what is ingestion process? The ingestion process is the uptake of food from wherever it is, maybe it's in your plate, all the way to the stomach. That's a process of ingestion. And so the process of ingestion involves two key things. 
it will involve the process of mastication or chewing, which is the mechanical breakdown of food using your teeth in the mouth. And there are some food products that will require mastication. Then after food has been masticated, that food must be swallowed. So swallowing is also a process within the ingestion. Ingestion involves mastication and swallowing. After that, food needs to be digested. Digestion is the enzymatic breakdown of food into smaller particles which the body can absorb. And so carbohydrates, lipids, and uh, proteins are actually digested by the body. And there are several enzymes from multiple sites which participate in digestion. After digestion of food, now remember digestion largely occurs within the duodenum as well as jejunum, but there's some significant digestion that also takes place in the stomach. So stomach, duodenum, and jejunum are the primary sites of digestion. Then we have the absorption process, which is now the uptake of nutrients from the hologit into the bloodstream. That is the absorption process. Most of the absorption process will be taking place in the ileum as well as in the large gut. The large gut largely for water and minerals and uh, nutrients largely from the ileum. Lastly, we have the process of defecation, which is the process of releasing or um, evacuating the remnants of what you would taken in. It's the mechanism that the body uses to release the remnants. So these are the basic processes that food undergoes. Now let's look at the second agenda, which is talk about the components of the hologit in an orderly manner, proximal distally. We are just going to follow the path that is followed by food. So basically, we are looking at the parts of the alimentary canal. Now, take it easy. Food enters your mouth. So the mouth is the first sight. From the mouth, food goes to your pharynx, which is somewhere there. From the pharynx, food goes to the esophagus. We call it the food pipe or the gullet. Just call it esophagus. From the esophagus, food goes to the stomach, thing that we all know. Then from the stomach, food goes to the small bowel or the small intestine. And in talk of small intestine here, we are referring to some three segments in order. The first segment of the small intestine is the duodenum, followed by jejunum, and then lastly, ileum so that uh, the small intestine consists of those three segments in that order, duodenum, then jejunum, then ileum. After that, food goes to the large intestine. You might be uncomfortable now to call it food, but okay, whatever name you want to give it. From the small intestine, it will go to the large intestine. When you talk of the large intestine or the large bowel, we are referring to a number of segments as well. So within that, we have the cecum, we have the colon, we have the rectum, and we have the endocanal. So all those are parts of the large bowel, cecum, colon, rectum, and uh, endocanal. You notice that the colon has multiple segments, but it's still colon, it's still part of large bowel. Now, food will pass through that channel that I've given you. There's another component to the large bowel, which food doesn't pass through though, but still part of the large bowel. That is the vermiform appendix. That structure there attached to the cecum is what we call the vermiform appendix. So the appendix is part of the large intestine however small it is. However, food does not go through the appendix, but still part of the large intestine. So there are five parts of the large intestine. 
that is the path followed by food. That's basically the alimentary canal. Now let's mention the different sphincters which are along the wall of the alimentary canal. So remember, sphincters are sites of constriction and basically they tend to limit motion, movement of food particles from one segment to another. So when you swallow, the first narrowing is found at the junction between the pharynx and the esophagus. We call that one the upper esophageal sphincter. This upper esophageal sphincter is formed by a muscle that we call the cricopharyngeus muscle. The junction between the pharynx and the esophagus. This is the narrowest part of the alimentary canal, actually. So that if you had a child that swallowed something, maybe a coin, and the coin managed to go through the upper esophageal sphincter, then you have less to worry about because that coin is likely to pass through any other place. The upper esophageal sphincter is the narrowest part of the alimentary canal. That's a protective mechanism so that whatever passes through there must pass through. Well, it will depend on what has been swallowed. You know, if it is a battery or something, you know, th this could be chemically active and so it must be removed. But if it, as someone just swallows something inert, you don't really have to worry much about them as long as they've gone through the upper esophageal sphincter. Of course, if something sharp or chemically active, then intervention need to be done for those reasons. The second sphincter is at the junction between the esophagus and the stomach. We call the lower esophageal sphincter. This lower esophageal sphincter is also called the cardiac sphincter. And it's the one that prevents backflow from the stomach to the esophagus. The lower esophageal sphincter is called the cardiac sphincter. It prevents reflux from the stomach to the esophagus. Pyloric sphincter is at the junction between the stomach and the duodenum. Pyloric sphincter generally controls gastric output. It controls gastric emptying. So that uh, the stomach is a store, yes, but now the pyloric sphincter releases food pole pole slowly through the sphincter to the duodenum. There's a sphincter which is not really controlling movement of food, but I want to mention it as well. We call it the sphincter of Odi. The sphincter of Odi control movement of bile and uh, movement of pancreatic juice into the alimentary canal, into the duodenum. So this sphincter does not control food movement but it's controlling the secretions from the liver or biliary tree and secretions from the pancreas into the duodenum. We call the sphincter of Odi. There's a sphincter which largely functions as a valve. You know, a valve allows unidirectional movement at the junction between the ileum and the cecum. And so we call the ileocecal valve. So that's the ileocecal valve. So this one prevents reflux to the small bowel from the large bowel. It prevents stool from refluxing to the small bowel. Then we have the anal sphincter. There are two types of anal sphincter. There's the internal anal sphincter and the external anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter consists of smooth muscles. So this is an involuntary muscle. It's an involuntary sphincter. If it's involuntary, it means that uh, you don't have conscious control over it. And so it's co coordinated by the autonomic nervous system. 
made up of smooth muscles. But then we have another sphincter, which we call the external anal sphincter. The external anal sphincter is voluntary to mean that uh, it's made up of skeletal muscles. And so you have conscious control of it. And it's good that both sphincters are there. The one that controls it when you are not conscious, like maybe when you are asleep, so you don't wake up and find that you've soiled yourself. But also we need the voluntary one so that maybe you're in class or you are in a public uh, place like a public transport, you know, you need to control either movement of stool or even movement of gas. You need to control that one voluntarily. And so that's why both sphincters are important. So these are the various sphincters which are along the digestive system. Remember, they all control food movement apart from this one, the sphincter of OD. Now let's look at the structural organization of the gut wall. We are going to spend some time on objective number four and objective number five. Now let's start with that object number four, structural organization of the gut wall. Basically, want us to look at the histological structure of the wall of the alimentary canal. And let's take a typical wall like esophagus, stomach, or the intestines generally. Uh, the mouth and the pharynx may not be very typical. So let's take the others. There is a basic structure organization of the JT wall. The JT wall consists of four histological layers, the innermost being called the mucosa, followed by what we call the submucosa, followed by what we call the muscular layer, and lastly, the adventitia or the serosa. Let's look at these histological layers one by one and see what each is made up of. So that is the mucosa, then submucosa muscularis or muscular layer and adventitious cells. We can begin with the mucosal layer, the innermost layer. The innermost layer of the JT wall, the mucosal layer, consists of three things. We have the epithelium that lines that particular segment of the alimentary canal. Deep to that epithelium, we have a connective tissue layer just deep to that epithelium. That connective tissue layer is what you call the lamina propria. Then deep to that connective tissue layer, we have a thin layer of smooth muscle, which we call muscularis mucosa. So these are the three components of the mucosal layer. In this image, that is the lining epithelium, then that is the lamina propria, and that is the muscularis mucosa. Now let's say something about the lining epithelium. The lining epithelium of the alimentary canal, remember it's largely for protection, but it will be varying depending on which segment of the alimentary canal you're in. For example, if we are looking at the esophagus, remember from your previous lectures on organization of epithelium, the esophagus consists of stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. How about the oral cavity? It consists of either stratified squamous non-keratinous epithelium or stratified squamous paracreatinous epithelium, what we call masticatory epithelium. How about the stomach? Now, the journey from the stomach all the way to the rectum is predominantly simple columnar epithelium. That makes it easy. We've already talked about the segments of the JT proximal distally. So understand from the stomach all the way to the rectum, that is largely simple column epithelium. Well, in the anal canal again, we expect the stratified squamous non keratinous epithelium. So the epithelium varies depending on the segment. Lamina propria is largely 
a connective tissue zone, as I've told you. That connective tissue zone may have uh, some glands, like what you can see in this particular image. It may have some glands. Now, those glands, which are within the lamina propria, are known as mucosal glands. They are exocrine glands, so they have their lumen emptying into the cavity of the alimentary canal. But as you can see, that's a gland, that's another gland. They are embedded within the lamina propria. We call them mucosal glands. Several parts of the alimentary canal have mucosal glands, and they may have different names depending on where we are. For example, the mucosal glands in the stomach, there are very many. The stomach has very many mucosal glands, and we call them gastric glands. How about the ones in the small and large intestine? There are also many, may not be as prominent as the ones of the stomach, but they're still there. Those ones in the intestines are called the crypts of Libacun. You can just call them the intestinal crypts. So the intestinal crypts of Libacun are the mucosal glands within the intestines, both small as well as large intestine. Other than mucosal glands, the mucosa and largely still within the lamina propria contain the, what we call malt. Malt stands for mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. This mucosa associated lymphatic tissue can either be diffuse, which means that they're not well circumscribed, in which case we call them diffuse lymphatic tissue, or they could be well circumscribed, although they don't have a capsule, in which case we call them lymphatic nodules. So mucosa associated lymphatic tissue can either be diffuse lymphatic tissue, which are not well circumscribed, you can't see the margins properly, or they can be what we call lymphatic nodules or lymphatic follicle and nodule go together. They're the same thing. Lymphatic nodules or lymphatic follicle. Those ones are well circumscribed. You can actually see the boundary between the lymphatic tissue and the surrounding connective tissue, although there is no capsule. So they are not capsulated but they're definite, you can see them, they're well circumscribed, they're discrete. Whether they are diffuse or they're discrete, they're part of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue for fighting infections. So they're basically aggregations of lymphocytes. Now, the concept of mucosa-associated lymphatic tissue is not limited to the alimentary canal. Even respiratory system will have it urinary system will have it, reproductive system will have it. So specifically, the ones which are in the alimentary canal can therefore be called GALT. And GALT here, the G there stands for GUT, associated lymphatic tissue. So the malt within the alimentary canal is specifically called GALT. The ones in the respiratory system may have a different name. We call them bronchus associated lymphatic tissue. So the concept here is just about naming depending on where they're found, but structurally they perform the same things. The mucosa of the alimentary canal may have folds. The folds could be of different varieties. They could be longitudinal folds, which means following the long axis of the alimentary canal. And the longitudinal folds are largely seen in the esophagus as well as in the rectum. Those ones have longitudinal folds, folds which take the long axis of the lumen. Then there's some large folds which are irregular, known as rugae, very characteristic of the stomach, and I'll show you how rugae look like. Then there's some which are circular, complete rings. We call them plicae or plica circularis. These ones are specific to the small bowel. The small bowels are the ones which have the plicae. They are complete rings, circular rings. 
in terms of faults? Well, they usually faults of the submucosa, which is translated into the mucosa. And in our next class, when you're going to look at intersigns, you're going to see how the plica look like. Then we have villi as well. Villi are finger-like projections, which extend into the lumen of the alimentary canal, very characteristic, again, of the small bowel villi. They're finger-like projections, increasing the surface area for absorption. So mucosa may have faults. The mucosal lining, and especially specifically the epithelial lining, usually has goblet cells. Well, the purpose of the goblet cells is just to produce mucus that is a lubricant. The number of goblet cells increase as you go down, and you can take the journey from the stomach going downwards. The number of goblet cells which are present in the lining epithelium the ones which are present within that simple column epithelium increase as you move down. So we'll expect that the rectum will have more goblet cells compared to the small intestine. Right, that is organization of the mucosa. How about the second histological layer, the submucosa? The submucosal layer is a layer of dense, irregular connective tissue. This layer is the one that largely provides structural integrity to the wall of the JT. It's the one that provides strength. It may, well, it does contain blood vessels. It also contains nerve plexuses. The nerve plexus, which is found within the submucosa, is part of the enteric nerve plexus. The enteric nerve plexus, the nerve plexus of the JT wall. Now, usually the enteric nerve plexus consists of two plexuses. There's one within the layer of the submucosa. Therefore, we call it the submucosal plexus or Meissner's plexus. This one controls secretions of the JT. They control JT secretions. And then there's another one, which is usually found within the muscular layer. That one control peristalsis, as you're going to see. So the one that is found within the submucosa is submucosal nerve plexus, which control JT secretions. And these secretions can either be endocrine as well as exocrine secretions. We also have lymphatics within the submucosa. So yes, there are lymphatic channels within the submucosa. And occasionally, we may also have some lymphatic uh, nodules and uh, diffuse lymphatic tissue, again, within the submucosa, although most of them are within the lamina propria. Now, there are some segments of the alimentary canal that contain glands within the submucosa. Glands which extend or which are found within the submucosa are known as submucosal glands. Don't confuse them with the mucosal glands. Only two regions of the JT have submucosal glands. One of them is the esophagus. So we have submucosal glands of the esophagus. We call them esophageal glands. Then the other one is the duodenum. The submucosal glands in the duodenum are called the glands of Bruna. They are important in producing um, mucoid secretion that has high pH to be able to neutralize the gastric acid. So take note is that uh, two regions of the JT have submucosal glands, esophagus and duodenum. The ones in the duodenum are known as the submucosal glands of Bruna. You can just call them the Bruna's glands. There's no other part of the JT that will have glands within the submucosa apart from those two. That becomes very key when you're going to identify a part of the JT. So in this image, you can see, so this is how a submucosal gland will be, or even that one. It extends into the submucosa, although the lumen still open into 
the duct still open into the lumen of the alimentary canal. If the mucosal glands will be located within the lamina propria there. All right, the last, sorry, the third layer, the muscular layer. The muscular layer of the GAT is generally called muscularis externa. This is to distinguish it from the muscularis mucosae, which is also called muscularis interna. So muscularis mucosa is also called muscularis interna. And so this muscular layer, the third layer, is generally called muscularis externa. Some people call it muscularis propria, yani proper muscular layer. For most parts of the JT, the muscular layer, muscularis propria, consists of smooth muscles, which are organized in two orientations. The inner orientation, are in a circular manner, like these ones. So we talk of the inner circular layer of smooth muscles. Then the outer orientation is in a longitudinal manner. We talk of outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscle. That applies for most parts of the JT wall. Between these two muscle layers or muscle orientation, is a nerve plexus. Now, this is what we call the myenteric nerve plexus or the plexus of Auerbach. The Auerbach plexus are responsible for controlling contractions within the JT. We call those ones peristalsis. So they control contractions within the JT wall. Remember, they are still part of the enteric nervous system, but now this is within the muscle layer controlling peristalsis. Remember the other one was in the submucosa controlling secretions. Other than what I've told you, and especially about how the muscles are organized then the point number one, there are some variations to that particular general rule that I've given you. And let me highlight on those variations. We have some variations in the pharynx, in the esophagus, in the stomach, in the colon, and regions of the sphincters. Now, let me highlight on why I say there are some variations. Let me start with the easiest one, the sphincters. I've already given new regions where we have sphincters. Wherever there's a sphincter, yes, that orientation will be fine except that at sphincters, the circular layer is significantly thicker. So the circular layer is more prominent at the regions of the sphincters. That's the notable variation I want to capture as regarding the sphincters. The inner circular layer become more prominent compared to the outer longitudinal layer. How about at the region of the pharynx? At the region of the pharynx, I'll give you two unique exceptions or unique variations. One of them is that the pharynx is not made up of smooth muscles. The muscular layer of the pharynx is not made up of smooth muscles. They are made up of skeletal muscles. So that is one unique thing about the pharynx. The other unique thing about the pharynx is that the orientation of the muscles of the pharynx is different. For the pharynx, we have inner longitudinal and outer circular layer of skeletal muscles. So take note of those two unique variations for the pharynx in terms of the muscular layer. How about the esophagus? The esophagus takes this general concept of inner circular, outer longitudinal, but the exceptions are this. The upper esophagus is made up of skeletal muscles. The lower third of the esophagus is made up of smooth muscles. The middle third of the esophagus is a mixture of skeletal and smooth muscles. So that's the unique thing about the muscular layer of the esophagus. Upper third, skeletal, lower third, smooth, middle third, mixed. 
How about stomach? What is the notable variation there? For stomach, well, the wall, the muscular layer is thick, it's more prominent, but that applies to all of them. It has a thick muscular wall. Other than that one, the stomach has three orientation of muscles instead of two. So yes, these two are there. We have the circular one and we have the longitudinal one that there, but there's another additional one. This additional one is on the inside. And because it's the innermost, it will now make the circular one be in the middle. So for stomach, we talk of outer longitudinal, middle circular, and the inner one usually runs oblique. So you talk of inner oblique. Inner oblique, middle circular, and outer longitudinal layer of muscles. That is, those are the exceptions or the variations we see in the stomach concerning this particular layer. How about lastly, the colon? Well, the colon will still have the inner circular and the outer longitudinal layer of smooth muscles except that the outer longitudinal layer of muscle is not a continuous layer. It just exists in bands. Those bands appear like tape. Those tapes of the colon are rightfully called the tinea coli. So tinea coli are bands of outer longitudinal layer of muscles found within the colon. Right, that is uh, enough concerning the muscular layer organization of the JT wall. Now let's talk about the last layer, the adventitial layer. The adventitial layer is the outermost layer. This outermost layer consists of a thin layer of connective tissue. And this thin layer of connective tissue may be lined by peritoneal membrane. Now, the peritoneal layer that will be lining it is the visceral peritoneum. If it is lined by peritoneum, then it is termed serosa. If it is not lined by peritoneum, then it's termed adventitia. So think about it. Things like uh, esophagus. A large part of the esophagus is not lined by peritoneum because it is in the neck, then thorax. So that one will predominantly have adventitia. How about things like ileum that are completely invested by the peritoneum? Those ones will have serosa. Good, so that's the structural organization of the JT wall. Now to make that be more reasonable for you, the reason I've taken you through that one is so that I make you have an understanding if you're given a slide, a histological slide of a segment of the hollow JT, will you be able to identify it? And the answer should be yes, that you should be able to identify and say, this is the duodenum, this is the rectum, this is the esophagus. So just to recap that from a practical perspective, if you're given a histological slide, what are you going to use to help you identify the part of that particular gut. In the mucosa, you need to check for a number of things. The type of epithelium will guide you. Remember, yes, most parts are simple columna, but esophagus is stratified squamous non keratinist as well as the anus. The oral cavity may be that or maybe masticatory epithelium. So when you look at the epithelial type, it can guide you on which part of the JT you're looking at. If it is simple columna, you have quite uh, a choice to make, but at least uh, you can say either stomach or the intestines, large or small. So anyway, the type of epithelium can guide you. The other thing that can guide you is the type of mucosal folds which are present. If you see longitudinal folds, Think about esophagus or rectum. If you see villi, think about the small intestine. If you see rings of folds, think about small intestine as well. 
If you see rugae, think about stomach. So the type of mucosal folds will help. Also, look at how much the goblet cells are in that epithelium. And this is better when you're comparing two rather than just having one, unless you've been seeing them for quite a while. But the concept here is that uh, the number of goblet cells, if there are so many, then most likely you're in the distal part of the JT as opposed to the proximal segments of the JT. The presence of microvilli can be noted if you magnify further. At high magnification, you're able to see microvilli being present on the cells, the epithelial cells. If you see microvilli, remember microvilli is different from villi. Microvilli is telling you that this region is highly absorptive. So when you see microvilli, think about the small intestine. The presence of and amount of mucosal glands will also help you. If you see mucosal glands and there are many, think about stomach, it has many mucosal glands. How about uh, if you see a lot of mucosa associated lymphatic tissue? Well, all parts of the JT will have mucosa associated lymphatic tissue. However, if there are several lymphatic nodules, you think about two regions. It's either the appendix or it is the ileum. Those are the ones with several mucosa associated lymphatic tissue either the appendix or it is the ileum. And the ones in the ileum specifically have a name, we call them the pear patches. Well, another site that could also have a lot is if you've taken a section that captures the tonsillar tissues, you remember the concept of the Waldeas ring around the pharynx. So if you take a section that captures the tonsillar tissue around the pharynx, we may also have a lot of lymphatic you will see a lot of malt, except that uh, that is unlikely to give you a complete wall of the alimentary canal, because remember the pharynx is really quite large. So those are the things to check in the mucosa to help you. How about in the submucosa? The leading thing in the submucosa is the presence of the submucosal glands. The moment you see glands in the submucosa, you only have two options. Is it esophagus or is it the duodenum? In the muscular layer, a number of things can guide you. The type of muscles present, are they skeletal muscles or are they smooth muscles? If they're skeletal muscles, you know, you'll be seeing striations. And that will help you narrow down. Is it pharynx or esophagus? If you're not seeing skeletal muscles, then they're not those particular regions. Well, remember esophagus, the lower one can be not be having skeletal muscles anyway but the presence of skeletal muscles guide you significantly. How much of the muscles are there? Are the muscular layer very thick? Think about stomach or think about a sphincter. Is it a sphincter or is it the stomach? There's a volume of muscle. The number of muscle layers will also guide you. Are there three layers of muscles? It's the stomach. Two layers of muscles, okay, think about anywhere else. And the organization of the outer layer, in particular, I have in mind the fact that uh, colon will have bands of longitudinal muscle. So when you see the outer layer of muscle in bands, then think about colon. Now, I want you to understand that slide really well, because I want to project to you some three slides and I'll want you to be able to identify the histological region that that slide has been obtained from, if you've understood what this means. So the first one is this one. So we are presented with a region of the GIT, that's the lumen, and so this is the epithelial lining. And we can see this, the muscular layer. 
we can see inner circular layer and we can see outer longitudinal layer of muscle. We don't see the peritoneum, but uh, that could be because of preparation or actually that it didn't have. So I don't usually like talking much about the adventitia or the serosa. But at least that's the outer lentil layer of muscle, this is the inner lentil layer of muscle. So this is the muscular layer. And that makes this region to be the submucosa. And C, we see submucosal glands. So already you are thinking, is it the duodenum or is it the esophagus? Just because we've seen the submucosal glands, these ones are submucosal glands. A higher magnification of it is that one. This one captures the epithelial lining. We see stratified squamous non-keratinized epithelium. So already we know this cannot be duodenum. This is definitely esophagus. But there's some more story. Well, in this image, we see that it is stratified squamous non keratinized epithelium confirming esophagus. And uh, here we are seeing the submucosal glands. Again, we are just confirming the findings we had at lower multiplication. This one is a high multiplication of the muscular layer to help you understand that uh, outer longitudinal and inner circular layer of muscles. So that one I've told you, it's the slide of the esophagus. Now let's try another one. So this one I want you to try on your own. I'll show you three levels of magnification. The three plates here mean three levels of magnification. So I want you to look at them and then I'll allow you to unmute your mic and uh, just say something that uh, what you think this slide could be. So that's the lowest magnification, that's what we see. Then if I magnify the wall, that is what you see at that middle magnification. So I hope you're seeing it. This is the inside, the lumen is on this side, all the way to outside. And then the third magnification capturing largely on the inner sides, that is what we see. So three levels of magnification I've given you. Let me see in the chart, which part of the JT could this be? So just put it in the chart, I'll, I'll read. I'll not mention your name, but I'll check what you people have written based on the three levels of magnification I've given you. Which part of the alimentary canal could this be? Okay, so I've seen some people writing small intestine. It would be nice to be more specific than that one. Remember that three levels of the small intestine, duodenum, jejunum, and ileum. So if you are among those who said small intestine, be more specific. Okay, I'm going through that. Okay, I can close it there so that we go through it together. So I've checked through and uh, no one has gotten it correctly. But let's see why. From that lower magnification, we can see that yes, it's a luminal organ. And I've already told it's part of the JT. We are confirming it's a luminal organ. At this magnification, we can see some projections into the lumen. 
finger-like projections. These are the villi. And because we can see villi, then we are confirming this is small intestine. But now we're asking ourselves, which part of the small intestine is it? Is it the duodenum? Is it the jejunum? Or is it the ileum? For ileum, we expect to see a lot of pears patches, lymphoid aggregations. We are not seeing that one. So it cannot be ileum, as most of you have written. For jejunum, we expect to see a lot of those circular folds I told you. Maybe we'll revisit that again in our next class. We are not seeing those ones. This is the duodenum, but why is it the duodenum? Look at this region here. Now from here to there is the mucosa. So you see a lot of finger-like projections, the villi. From here, Today is a submucosa. What do you see in the submucosa? Prominent glands. These are submucosal glands of Bruna. Only two regions of the JT have several, have the submucosal glands, esophagus and duodenum. So this is duodenum. Okay, this is the muscular layer, inner circular and outer longitudinal layer of muscles. We don't see serosa, well, duodenum is retroperitoneal, but uh, we agreed we don't talk about much about that fourth layer. So this is the slide of the duodenum. Don't miss it again. Confirm the presence of the submucosal glands of Bruna. Here we can also see some goblet cells. So I told you that uh, this requires that you've been seeing much of it and following so that you're able to know whether this is a lot or little. Last slide that I wanted to identify is this one. Again, three magnifications. So this lowest magnification, that is what we see. And then uh, that second level of magnification, that is what we see. So I'm giving you time to just have a visual appreciation of that. And then lastly, is the third level of magnification. That is what we see. Again, I'll allow you to just put it in the chat there. So let me call it question three so that I'm able to distinguish from the previous ones. Okay, put it in the chat. Tell me which part of the JT would this slide be? There are those who have said stomach, I can see esophagus, I can see colon, I can see sphincter. Okay, those are the options that, uh, okay, there's also upper esophagus here. Okay, let's see. So at this magnification, we confirm it's aluminum organ. Well, I've already told it's aluminum organ and it's part of the JT. So we're not debating on that one. At this magnification, we can see some three bumps, that one, that one, and that one. We want to see them at a better magnification. This is how one of them look like. We capture that uh, that bump is actually in the muscular layer and specifically the outer longitudinal layer of muscle. This is the inner layer which is circular, this is the outer layer, which is existing in bands. That makes it colon by all means. This is a colon. But we can also confirm that the colon by looking at, uh, look at the mucosa. At high magnification, the cells we are seeing here are predominantly goblet cells. 
it tells you you are on the lower part of the JT, large bowel as opposed to small bowel. So the presence of the goblet cells there and the tinea coli should narrow it down to the colon. Great. So that is uh, how we identify the histological layers of the JT. We will revisit that again when we're going to look at the topic on organization of the small and the large bowel. I'll also give you some histological slides of the different segments of the JT so that we practice and identify histologically. Now let's finish by looking at the gross anatomical parts of the upper JT. We look at the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and stomach. This will be quick though. Let's start with the oral cavity. So the oral cavity has two compartments. There's this region here between the cheeks or lips and the dental arc. We call that the vestibule of the mouth. Then there's this region that is enclosed by the dental arc, which we call the oral cavity proper. When I talk of dental arc, I'm referring to the gum, the teeth, the teeth and the gum. So that arc is what we call the dental arc. The region external to the dental arc is the vestibule of the mouth and the region contained within the dental arc is the oral cavity proper. So things like the tongue are within the oral cavity proper. The roof of the mouth is called the palate. The anterior part of the palate usually has bone. So we call it hard palate. The posterior part does not have bone. We call it the soft palate. Posteriorly, the oral cavity is continuous, the oral pharynx. The junction between the oral cavity and the pharynx is this thing here. It's usually a fold of a muscle that usually come from the palate to the tongue. We call it the palatoglossal arc. The palatoglossal arc on the right and the left are sometimes called the pillars of fauces. So the pillars of fauces refer to the fold formed by the palatoglossus muscles, right and left. The palatoglossal arc or the palatoglossal fold. That the junction between the oral cavity proper and the oral pharynx. So you see the tonsil, the palate and tonsil is on the oral, oral pharynx as opposed to the oral cavity proper because the arc is there. So the palate and tonsils are in the oral pharynx. Even that one, that is part of oral pharynx. Remember, the oral cavity has a tongue, which is a muscular organ. I hope you remember some things about the tongue, about it having projections on the surface, which we call the papillae, circumvallate papilla, we have uh, the fungiform papilla, foliate papillae, and filiform papilla. They're just projections on the surface of the tongue. Of course, there are teeth as well in the oral cavity. And uh, I hope you know how many teeth are there in an individual. 32 in total for an adult. There are those that we call incisors one and two, we have canines one, we have the premolars uh, one and two, and we have the molars one, two, and three. There are openings of the salivary glands within the oral cavity. The openings of the salivary glands within the oral cavity are multiple, but let's talk about the openings of the major salivary glands. The parotid gland opens into the vestibule of the mouth opposite the second upper molar tooth. So somewhere there. But remember, vestibule of the mouth opposite the second upper molar tooth. That is opening of the parotid gland. Then you have openings of the submandibular gland, which is in the floor of the mouth just 
below the tongue there. On either side of the frenulum of the tongue, we have opening of the submandibular gland and multiple openings for the sublingual glands. Sublingual glands use multiple ducts to open. The submandibular gland has one duct. The opening there being called the, the puncta. So those two open in the oral cavity proper, not in the vestibule. We can talk about the pharynx now. The pharynx is a muscular tube that extends from the base of the skull up there to the upper part of the esophagus down there. So the whole of that is the pharynx. Having seen it, we can note therefore that it's a common passage for both food as well as air. And that is why it's a critical place to know its anatomy. We describe the pharynx as having three parts. The nasopharynx is that region there behind the nasal cavity. That one is not really part of the alimentary canal because food does not pass through the nasopharynx. But yes, an important part of the respiratory tree. The oropharynx is this region here behind the mouth. And the laryngopharynx is this region here behind the larynx. So food will pass through oropharynx as well as laryngopharynx, but doesn't pass through nasopharynx. Remember, the pharynx is made up of skeletal muscles. The skeletal muscles are the ones that form the wall of the pharynx. The unique thing about this skeletal muscle, the pharynx, is that you don't actually have conscious control over them. That is very unique. We know that skeletal muscles are usually voluntary muscles. But the skeletal muscles, the pharynx, are involuntary. You don't have conscious control over them. You, you swallow and it's largely autonomic, or rather, let me put it this way, it's largely subconscious. You don't have conscious control. You, you, you can't take food to your pharynx then say, let me return it back. You don't have control of it. They are involuntary skeletal muscles, very unique. Also, I told you that the organization of these skeletal muscles are also unique that you have circular muscles outside and longitudinal muscles inside. Now, the muscles of the pharynx have names and I want to know their names. The longitudinal muscles are inside and there are three. So they run vertically. There's one that comes from the styloid process. So you call it the stylopharyngeus muscle, that one. As you can see, it's from outside here, but it's going to enter inside, and so it's going to run from inside. That is the stylopharyngeus muscle. The others we're not seeing from here, but there's another one that comes from the palate to the pharynx. So we call it palatopharyngeus muscle. It just runs behind the palate and tonsils. Then there's another one that come near the opening of the auditory tube in the pharynx to go to the pharynx. So here, that's the opening of the auditory tube. So there's a muscle that come from there going down. We call it the tubopharyngeus muscle or salpingopharyngeus muscle. So three longitudinal muscles, Salpingopharyngeus, also called tubopharyngeus, come from there going down to the pharynx. Palatopharyngeus come from the palate going down to the pharynx. And uh, stylopharyngeus come from the salad process going to the pharynx. In this image, you can see the fold formed by the palatopharyngeus muscle. That is what is called the palatopharyngeal arc there. Great. So, Three longitudinal muscles, salpingopharyngeus, palatopharyngeus, and stylopharyngeus muscle. There are also three circular muscles. The circular muscles have simple names. We just call them constrictor muscles. Superior pharyngeal constrictor is that one. The middle pharyngeal constrictor is that one. 
and the inferior pharyngeal constrictor is that one. So superior, middle, and inferior pharyngeal constrictor muscles. The muscles of the pharynx are skeletal, but involuntary. Now we can talk about the esophagus. So the esophagus is a tube that connects the pharynx to the stomach. It's called the food pipe. There's a part of it that is in the neck. We call that the cervical segment in the thorax, thoracic segment, and a small part in the abdomen, the abdominal segment. The longest part is in the thorax, but there's a short segment in the abdomen and moderately long in the neck. The upper one third of the esophagus has skeletal musculature. Again, they are involuntary skeletal muscles. Middle third has mixed and lower third has smooth muscles, as I mentioned to you earlier. The esophagus has some sphincters, the upper esophageal sphincter formed by the lower part of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor. That lower part of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor come from the cricoid cartilage to the pharynx, and so it's called cricopharyngeus. So the cricopharyngeus is the lower part of the inferior pharyngeal constrictor, and it forms the upper esophageal sphincter. I told you that's the narrowest part of the alimentary canal. The lower esophageal sphincter is between the esophagus and the stomach. It's also called the cardiac sphincter. This one prevent regurgitation to the esophagus. Histologically, that is how the esophagus would look like. So this is the epithelial lining, which is stratified squamous non creatinized epithelium. And that is the submucosa that contain submucosal glands and the outer layer, sorry, the muscular layer has middle circular and outer longitudinal. I'd already shown you this slide, so no big deal, but that's the slide of the esophagus as we discussed earlier. Okay, some things to know about the esophagus. That the esophagus has some constrictions. I'll use these images to describe the things I want you to know. The first image I'm using it to demonstrate to you the constrictions of the esophagus. So esophagus has some constrictions. The first one at the level of the cricopharyngeus, we've already talked about that one, that's the upper esophageal sphincter. The second one is where the esophagus is crossing the arc of the aorta. So usually it's constricted a bit there by the arc of the aorta. The third one is where the esophagus is crossing the left principal bronchus. So it's also indented a bit by the left principal bronchus. Those two are usually very close together. And so some people just consider it as one. They call it the bronchoaortic constriction. Then the last one is where the esophagus crosses the diaphragm and enters the stomach. So that is the last constriction there, made by the diaphragm. Those are the constrictions of the esophagus. The second image demonstrates to us the nerve supply to the esophagus. So let's talk about innervation of the esophagus. Esophagus receives both uh, parasympathetic as well as sympathetic nerve supply. The parasympathetic nerve supply is by the vagus nerve. That's the 10th cranial nerve. The sympathetic nerve supply is from the sympathetic chain within the thorax. So that is with regard to nerve supply. The third image shows us the arterial blood supply to the esophagus. Now here, I want you to understand that the esophagus is also receiving segmental arterial blood supply. The upper part of the esophagus receives blood supply from the arteries that also supply the thyroid, like the inferior thyroid artery, supplying it. That is a cervical esophagus. The thoracic esophagus receives blood supply from 
the esophageal branches of the aorta, as well as the branches which go to the lung, the bronchial arteries. So bronchial arteries supply the esophagus, but also aorta supplies the esophagus directly. That is thoracic esophagus. And lower esophagus, the part of the esophagus, especially within the abdomen, receives blood supply from esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. The left gastric artery is the artery that supplies the stomach. So there are some esophageal branches of the left gastric artery. That's the arterial blood supply. Now, based on that arterial blood supply, there's something I want to understand about the venous drainage of the esophagus, which is of clinical importance. The esophagus is drained by several veins, again, segmentally. You can just call them esophageal veins. Esophageal veins in the upper esophagus, which means cervical part, will go to inferior thyroid veins. The esophageal veins in the thoracic segment go to the azygous system of veins. However, the esophageal veins from the lower esophagus drain to the veins which drain the stomach, eventually those veins will enter the portal vein. Now that is clinically important this way. If the veins in this region, lower esophagus, have two options, that they can drain to the left gastric vein which go to the portal vein, or they can join the azygous system of vein. That is important clinically. Why? Remember, port of vein takes blood to the liver, where again, we are going to find another capillary plexus. But the azygous vein takes blood to the spira vena cava directly. So we say that the lower esophagus is a site of portocaval anastomosis. We will rebuild on that concept next time when we look at the blood supply of the intestine and understand more about what is portocaval anastomosis. But to highlight in simple terms, these are regions where blood can either pass through the liver portal or go to the vena cava without passing through the liver. So you call it portocaval anastomosis or portosystemic anastomosis could be the commonest term in the textbooks. Regions with portosystemic anastomosis are very key when there is something called portal hypertension, when the pressure of blood within the liver is high. So blood cannot move freely from the liver to the inferior vena cava. That blood will have to find alternative route. And one of the alternative routes will be now in the lower esophagus. Sometimes you can have backflow from the liver blood goes through the portal vein, and then open up that anastomosis so that that blood can now redirect itself through a zygous vein to the heart. That means that these veins will be dilated, engorged, and they can even bleed. We call that esophageal varices. So portocaval anastomosis is an important thing, and esophagus is a site of portocaval anastomosis. That is a story of the esophagus. The next one we're going to talk about is the stomach. The stomach is located in the epigastrium of the abdomen, and there's some part of the stomach that extends to the left hypogastrium. In terms of gross anatomical parts, we usually describe it as having four, the fundus is this region of the stomach that extend above the level of the esophageal opening. The body is a larger part of the stomach, basically. The cardia is the region of the stomach around the esophageal opening. And uh, the pyloric region is this lower part that continues into the duodenum. The pyloric region consists of what we call the pyloric antrum, that proximal segment, and the pyloric sphincter, that region that contains the muscle of the pylorus. 
Now the stomach is also described to have uh, two curvatures. Is this curvature to the left, which you call the greater curvature, and this curvature to the right, which you call the lesser curvature. Notice that the lesser curvature is to the right and upwards, and the greater curvature is to the left and uh, on the lower part. The structures behind the stomach constitute what we call the stomach bed. So the stomach bed basically refer to the posterior relations of the stomach. A number of things are just behind the stomach. Importantly, we can mention the pancreas being within the stomach bed, as you can see that image there. We also have the upper pole of the left kidney, the left adrenal gland as well, which is on the upper pole of the left kidney, the splenic artery, which is a branch of the celiac trunk, is also on the bed there. And basically, the mesocolon that we are touching on the inferior margin of the esophagus, sorry, the inferior margin of the pancreas, we call that one the transverse mesocolon. So the transverse mesocolon is also part of the stomach bed. As in, we can see in this image, there's some parts of the diaphragm that could also be part of the stomach bed, like that one, which we call the left cruise of the diaphragm. So basically, when you talk of the stomach bed, we are referring to the structures which are on the posterior aspect of the stomach. There are some large folds of the mucosa of the stomach. We call them rugae. So these rugae are large mucosal folds of the stomach, very characteristic of the stomach. Anything else that is unique that I want to mention is this one. We've mentioned in the previous uh, part that uh, the muscular layer of the JT wall consists of two layers, basically, the inner circular and the outer longitudinal layer. However, in the stomach, that is different. Instead of having two layers of muscles in the muscularis propria, the stomach has three layers of muscles in the muscularis propria. Whatever was outside as longitudinal is retained. The circular layer is still retained, except that now it is not the innermost, it is in the middle. Then the addition here is the oblique layer of muscle, so that uh, the oblique layer of muscle is on the inner side. So for stomach, instead of talking of inner circular and outer longitudinal layers of muscles, we talk of inner oblique, middle circular and outer longitudinal layer of muscles. So stomach wall has three layers of muscles, inner oblique, middle circular and outer longitudinal. The mucosa of the stomach consists of several glands. We call them the gastric glands, several of them and I want, I'll be talking about them shortly. So what are the functions of the stomach? We can state that the stomach is a site for storage of food for about uh, three to four hours. It's also important for churning, mixing of food basically. There's some food products which are digested in the stomach. Basically, digestion begins in the stomach, but mainly continues in the duodenum. Some food substances can also be absorbed in the stomach. Stomach also has immune functions. Think about the acid within the stomach. It's able to kill as many germs as possible. And uh, the stomach also produces some substances, one important one being the intrinsic factor, which promote the absorption of vitamin B12. That does not mean that B12 is absorbed in the stomach. Basically, when you eat something that has the components of B12, the intrinsic factor from the stomach bind with the B12, and then they travel together up to the ileum, 
and that is where B12 is absorbed. So these are the key functions of the stomach. Now, let's look at how the stomach will look like histologically. This slide of the stomach wall. And uh, from our previous talk, you can capture a number of things here. First, we capture that the muscle layer is very thick. As you can see here, it has a thick muscular layer. Well, there's some large vessels that we are seeing as well, which are running in the adventitia. Stomach is well vascularized and a big vessel that run and that's an artery, that's a vein within the adventitia. Now, this one here is a muscular layer. You can see how thick that is. And this is the submucosal layer. We can see that it is devoid of uh, submucosal glands, as you indicated. Then this one here is a gastric mucosa. Perhaps that's a malt or gout. We can't say that there are many, but yes, we've seen that one. A higher magnification of the mucosa and the submucosa show us that you see this lining epithelium. Maybe we need a higher magnification to see that one, but see that convolution, that those are rugae, this large thing, that's one, that's another one, that's rugae. So that the stomach has folds in the mucosa that we call rugae. I also want to capture this magnification that there's some glands that we're seeing here within the lamina propria. And those are the gastric glands basically all over, extensive. And this is gout, that's gout, that's another gout. A closer look at the mucosa revealed that the epithelium is simple column epithelium. With several folds, you can see them. There were larger folds, now we also see smaller folds as well. They're still part of the gastric folds, basically. But importantly, I also want to notice these ones. There's some channels which go from the surface all the way deep. So those channels are the ones that are leading to the gastric glands. We call them the gastric pits. So these ones are gastric pits and they're the ones that lead to the gastric glands, which are deep. But on the surface, we can see that the stomach is lined by simple columnar epithelium. So capture that uh, the gastric pits run all the way from the surface of the stomach and uh, take you to the gastric glands, which are these ones. Important to note are the major falls, the epithelial type that line the stomach, the presence of the gastric pits and the several gastric glands, very unique to the gastric mucosa. So this is a long magnification where we started from. This is another slide intentionally captured at the level of the gastric glands just for you to appreciate how numerous the gastric glands are. So you see at the high magnification, they're all lined by simple cuboidal, simple column epithelium, extending deep from the lamina propria and the channels up to the surface. These are all gastric glands. Let's talk about the cell types, which are found within the gastric mucosa. We have a number of cell types. The mucus cells are several. Some of them are found in the neck. So they be called mucus neck cells. They produce mucus. We have what we call chief cells. The chief cells secrete pepsinogen. The parato cells are also there. The parato cells secrete hydrochloric acid, which is also called gastric acid, the secrete intrinsic factor, and the secrete gastroferrin. We have enterochromaffin like cells, which secrete histamine. 
So this is enterochromaffin-like cell which secretes histamine. We have the enteroendocrine cells. You can call them neuroendocrine cells. The enteroendocrine cells produce hormonal substances. We name them according to the type of hormone they produce. The G cells produce gastrin, the D cell produce somatostatin. So these are found, the cells which are found in the gastric mucosa. So while we're there, we can talk about the gastric juice. Gastric juice is secreted by gastric glands. So it's an exocrine secretion of the gastric glands. So you see from the glands deep there, the secretions go through the ductal portion, which are part of the pits, into the surface of the stomach. We produce about two liters of gastric juice per day. And the different cell types that we mentioned produce different secretions. Now let's look at that from the type of contents that are contained within within the gastric juice, apart from water, basically. Gastric juice contain pepsinogen, which is from the chief cells. The key role of pepsinogen is the digestion of proteins. What happened is that uh, pepsinogen become converted to pepsin. And pepsin is the enzyme that helps in the digestion of proteins. Hydrochloric acid is also a composition of the gastric juice, basically we call it gastric acid. And this one comes from the parato cells. They're also called oxyntic cells, by the way. The parato cells are also called oxyntic cells. The role of gastric acid is to activate pepsinogen to pepsin. Apart from that, the acid is also important in killing germs. So it has immune functions. That becomes one of the immune functions of the stomach, actually, the killing of germs. The acidity of gastric edges is usually so strong, close to about uh, two, the pH of two. Intrinsic factor is also another secretion which is found within the gastric juice, it is also produced by the parato cells. The function of the intrinsic factor is to promote the absorption of vitamin B12, which you've already indicated is absorbed in the ileum, but requires the presence of intrinsic factor. Gastroferrin is also another composition of the juice. This one also comes from parato cells. Gastroferrin promote the absorption of iron Again, iron is absorbed in the ileum. Histamine is a composition of this juice. Histamine comes from the enterochromaffin-like cells. The role of histamine in the stomach is not exactly similar with the role of histamine in most parts of the body. We know histamine to be promoting allergic reactions in very many parts of the body. Now that is based on the type of histamine receptors that histamine usually binds to in those many parts of the body. We call those receptors H1 receptors. Stimulation of H1 receptors by histamine stimulate or rather facilitate inflammatory reactions. However, the type of histamine receptors that are predominant in the stomach wall are the H2 receptors. H2 receptors, when stimulated by histamine, promote gastric acid secretion. And so the key role of histamine in the stomach is to promote gastric acid secretion. And that is why for somebody who may be having ulceration, sometimes it helps by just giving them drugs which inhibit the H2 receptors They'll still be antihistamines, but they're not the normal, the usual antihistamines that uh, you might be familiar with. But they're still antihistamines, then they, they can still be used in the management of ulceration. 
mucus is an important secretion from the gastric juice. And uh, mucus help to lubricate and also to protect the mucosa against corrosion by the acid and against basically abrasion by food. So these are the components of gastric juice. This flowchart help us to capture most of the things that uh, we've mentioned. So the juice contain a lot of water fine. The solids, we've talked about them. This flowchart divides them into those which are inorganic and those which are organic. And we talked about the organic ones largely. Remember that the juice will still contain some minerals and that will be basically largely inorganic. And there are quite a number well, in addition to the acid, which we've mentioned as a key component of the gastric juice. And the organic substances, we've mentioned about uh, pepsin as a major one, but as you can see, we also have others as well. Yes, we've also mentioned about mucin, as well as intrinsic factor and gastroferrin. You can add them there. Now, let's talk about the blood supply to the stomach. The stomach is one of those organs that receive a rich blood supply. The blood supply to the stomach is derived predominantly, or let me say largely, from the celiac trunk. The celiac trunk is one of the branches of the abdominal outer that supply the organs of the digestive system. Now, we talk of... Uh, five major arteries that supply the stomach in different parts. We start with the lesser curvature. The lesser curvature is supplied by two arteries. We have the left gastric artery, which is a direct branch of the celiac trunk. So it supplies the left side of the lesser curvature. That is left gastric artery. Then we have the right gastric artery which supplies the lesser curvature from the right side. This right gastric artery is a branch of the common hepatic artery, which is still arising from celiac trunk. So that is to the lesser curvature. Then to the greater curvature, again, two arteries. From the right side, we have what you call the right gastroepiploic artery. The right gastroepiploic artery is a branch of the gastroduodenal artery, which is a branch of the common hepatic artery, which is from celiac trunk still. So that is the right gastroepiploic artery. It supplies the greater curvature from the right side. Then the artery that supplies the greater curvature from the left side is known as the left gastroepiploic artery. The left gastroepiploic artery is a branch of the splenic artery. Again, splenic artery is a branch of the celiac tract. So we're taking this story and we've seen those major arteries that are rising from the celiac tract. One last category of arteries usually supplying the fundus of the stomach. We call them the short gastric arteries. The short gastric arteries are small branches, again, from the splenic artery, supplying the fundus of the stomach. So we can conclude and say that the stomach is supplied by branches of the celiac trunk, either directly or indirectly. This is because the stomach arises from what you call the foregut. When you look at embryology of the digestive system, you'll understand what is foregut, what is midgut, and what is hindgut. In terms of nerve supply, stomach receives both sympathetic and parasympathetic innervation. The parasympathetic innervation is through the vagus nerves. So we have what you call the anterior vagal trunk and the posterior vagal trunk. 
the anterior vagal trunk is basically what was originally the left vagus nerve. And the posterior vagal trunk is what was originally the right vagus nerve. So the branches of the vagus nerve to the stomach are many. They offer parasympathetic supply. Then sympathetic innervation to the stomach come from what we call the splanchnic nerves. Remember the splanchnic nerves are from the lower thoracic uh, sympathetic nerves, which go direct to the abdomen. And so those splanchnic nerves are the ones that also participate in the innervation to the stomach. From your physiology, you can help remind yourself about effects of parasympathetic stimulation to the stomach, as well as effects of uh, sympathetic stimulation to the stomach. That is what either the vagal stimulation will do. So you just review that and ask yourself, what will sympathetic stimulation do? This image captures very nicely the innervation of the stomach as well as the arteries, but uh, largely for the innervation. The last image is showing us the lymphatic drainage of the stomach, which is also very rich. Lymphatic drainage of the stomach follow the arteries that supply the stomach. And uh, the statement to make here is that irrespective of how these lymphatics will go, eventually they'll be directed to the celiac nodes. Because the arteries were also eventually from the celiac artery. So the lymphatics also drain eventually the celiac nodes. Well, the patterns of how the lymphatics will run could be very uh, complex and uh, extensive, but eventually they go there. So the, this zone here will most likely go via the left gastric node first, but eventually take you there. This region of the stomach will most likely go via the pancreatical splenic nodes. And uh, this region here will most likely go via the right gastroepiplic nodes, which will then go to prepylonic nodes. And uh, these ones here will most likely connect the hepatic nodes, which eventually take you to the, again, the celiac nodes. So the lymphatics of the stomach eventually go to the celiac nodes. Right, so that marks the end of that lecture on the general organization of the digestive system, as well as organization of the various components of the upper JT. We have looked at the oral cavity, pharynx, esophagus, and the stomach. Generally, when you talk of upper JT, we usually include the duodenum as well, but I've chosen to discuss duodenum with the rest of the small intestine so that we can be able to have some similarities which, which we can discuss together to prevent us from just repeating ourselves so much. So thank you very much. We'll stop there. The next lecture will be on anatomy of the small and small intestine as well as anatomy of the large intestines. Thank you very much. <laughs>